Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. On today's programme, actor Denzel Washington returns in the sequel to Vigilante box office smash The Equaliser. We're meeting a photographer who captures scenes of war through the eyes of children and we'll be finding out how Peruvian women are sowing a brighter future. But first... Portrait of a Prodigy. We'll meet these incredibly young, incredibly talented hyperrealism artists from Nigeria. Miss Bennett. Mr. Doss, he's all easy. It's a truth universally acknowledged that Jane Austen's legacy and the characters she created are alive and well 200 years after her death. Jane Austen remains one of the most celebrated authors of all time. She gave us Mr. Darcy, the Bennet sisters, and some of the most quintessential love stories ever written. Her caustic wit and insight into Regency life have led to countless adaptations, modernizations, and even a zombie reimagining of her most famous novel, Pride and Prejudice. And as July the 18th marks the anniversary of her death, let's take a closer look at the woman behind the words. One of the most iconic writers of all time, Jane Austen, was born on the 16th of December 1775 in Hampshire, England. Similar to the characters in her books, Austen had a big family too. She had six brothers and a sister. Young Austen hinted her talent early on. That's how you say it, all together like that. As an adolescent, she wrote humorous short stories to be read among friends and family. How dare you address me, sir? Be gone, I will have you whipped. Outrageous. Have you never met him? No, I know him well. I would never speak to a stranger like that. Although we can't say that her books are autobiographical, some of the characters and events in her books are inspired by her personal life. For instance, like the two eldest Bennet sisters from the world-renowned Pride and Prejudice, Jane Austen and her sister Cassandra were best friends too. She took some of the last names in her books from the wealthy English families of the time. The heart is stirred. And if you've seen Becoming Jane, you might know that Jane Austen couldn't marry the man she loved, an Irish politician, Tom Lefroy. The fiction is desirable. Money is absolutely indispensable. Lefroy's family strongly opposed the match, saying, if he marries a nobody like Jane, he'll lose his inheritance. What value would there be in life if we are not together? The young couple had to break off their friendship. But same year, Jane Austen finished her first draft of Pride and Prejudice, where love prevails with a strict class system, unlike her own experience. Even though she did receive other marriage proposals later on, she refused to marry anyone she wasn't in love with. And she also pointed out how a married woman in the 19th century wouldn't have a chance to write any novels. She said she'd prefer writing her books, to which she often referred as her darling children. Again, Emma. Historical studies show how much Jane Austen was engrossed in her characters. Lovely. She would tell her friends what the characters were doing after the books ended. I hate John! Apparently, Jane Fairfax from Emma dies 10 years after the book ends. Lovely, lovely. To apologize for not receiving it properly. Is all ease and friendliness. I'm as astonished as you are. And Kitta from Pride and Prejudice ends up marrying a clergyman from Pemberley. Come man, admit it, she's an angel. The writer who changed the novel tradition for the English literary canon died in the arms of her beloved sister at aged 41. Today, 200 years after her death, Jane Austen continues to survive through her witty fictional world. If my daughter were not the greatest simpleton on earth, she'd be engaged to him now. But, Mama, I can see Sir James is a kind man, but marriage is for one's whole life. Not in my experience. She inspired many books, films, endless Colin Firth as Mr. Darcy merchandise, and yes, her face is even on the £10 note. But, all that aside, had she been alive today, the one thing that would probably have surprised her the most would have been an entire culture of Austenites, people who adore the legacy she left behind. Her characters, the depictions of the bonnet-filled Regency era, balls, and an overall reverence to emotions. 
And joining me from London to discuss exactly what makes Austen so important is novelist, biographer and editor of Jane Austen, Janet Todd. Janet, thank you very much for joining us. A pleasure. Now, we know that Jane Austen was very popular 200 years ago, and she really encapsulates Regency England. But what do you think it is about her that is so enduring, and why are we still talking about her today? Well, actually, she wasn't very popular 200 years ago. When, when she died, um, shortly afterwards, her novels fell out of print, and um, it was only a, a little later that, that her popularity started to grow and grow and grow till it reached now a global stage. Um, I think the popular, she's associated with Regency England, but the word Regency has started to mean, um, you know, pretty cottages and little fancy dresses and high bodices and a little rumpty tump. Um, but really, the Regency period was a very turbulent, troubled time, um, squashed between the French Revolution and the Industrial Revolution. And a lot of that appears in Jane Austen. So although it looks as though it's an idyllic, separate time, very different from our own, there's much in it that speaks exactly to us. But I think it's not the historical side of things that really pulls Jane Austen into so many lives. It really is the, the amazing psychological realism of the characters and of the world. I mean, they, you can say that the world is very different and none of us is from the gentry class of England in 1800. But we all have to make the choices about who we live with, how we choose a partner, how they choose us, how we deal with an inner life that is very special to, our, to ourselves and an outer world that asks for compromises all the time, mm -hmm. how we deal with embarrassing families, all that. We can very much go on. relate <laughs> yes. to everything that she speaks to. 200 years ago, it still relates today. Now, I wanted to talk about Sanderton, which is Jane Austen's final novel that was never, in fact, finished. We've just found out that Andrew Davis is going to be doing an adaptation for ITV. How do you think he's going to be able to adapt something that never had a conclusion? And do you think that he will be able to stay true to Jane Austen's style? Well, I don't think he needs to stay true because he's making a film, which is an adaptation, which may have some inspiration from the book, but it's going to be a long way from it. And no doubt he will sex it up in his usual way. Um, but there are lots of continuations of the book. There are lots of people who plan it out in a certain way. And even if the first continuer, as it were, um, her niece, um, Anna Lefroy, even if you take that as the standard, um, knowing the story is only a little bit of what makes Jane Austen so great. So. Yes, it'll be a fun thing, probably, and some of Jane Austen may creep into it. But I think what Andrew Davis will make is something quite different. And but you... it's, it's, it's actually a wonderful... Sorry, so I was just going to say it, it is a wonderful small fragment and quite unlike anything else that Jane Austen wrote or that we know that she wrote. And moving on to some of the more modern adaptations, we have Clueless, for example. Why do you think Austen lends, it, lends herself so well to being uh, modernised and being brought firmly into kind of our time? Well, it's, it's mainly Pride and Prejudice this is happening to, which is, in a way, the one that sticks out from her novels. And it is the most romantic in the sense that it's that classic romance story of a young, um, not very well off, perhaps humble, not in the case of Elizabeth Bennet, but perhaps um, ordinary girl who manages somehow to capture the prince. It's Cinderella. Um, and so it's a very appealing story if you just take the storyline. Um, it's the story of Jane Eyre, of Wuthering Heights, of Rebecca, and so on. Um, so it lends itself to being adapted and readapted. Um, at the same time, it's also about families and the comedy of coping with embarrassing families. And again, that's pretty common. That's pretty much any society and any time. So I think it lends itself to that. And because Jane Austen has such a simple exterior, the, the, the surface of Jane Austen seems very superficial. It seems almost as though you could do it yourself until you try and you see you can't. So that it's easy to translate her into other periods. Um, and I think she translates quite well um, 
Bridget Jones's diary, for example, um, is the Pride and Prejudice story. And it works. There's Bride and Prejudice, the Indian one, and so on. And the other thing I should say about Pride and Prejudice is that it's probably the only one of the novels where the characters float free from the novel. Um, you can sort of take them anywhere so that Darcy, the famous hero, um, can be moved to Texas or he can go to Pakistan or he can become a vampire um, or a werewolf. He can, he can just float above the novel altogether. Um, and there are not many characters in literature where this can happen. I think when I was thinking about it just now, I think possibly only Sherlock Holmes would be equivalent to that. We recognize him wherever he throws up, whether it's in London or Texas. She's created a kind of real universe, universality, I suppose. And so it's been 200 years since she died. Do you think that in 200 years' time, we're still going to be talking about Jane Austen and her appeal? Well, pretty hard to judge that far away, and God knows what the technology will be by then. But I don't see why not. In some ways, she's become a sort of lingua franca amongst reading people. Um, wherever you go in the world, if they've read Jane Austen, you can talk about the characters, talk about the books. Um, it's something that you have in common, possibly mainly with women, but generally, I think, with a reading public. So I don't see why she shouldn't go on. She's a bankable global phenomenon at the moment, and long may it last. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Janet Todd, thank you so much for that fantastic insight. Thank you very much. He's an 11-year-old trying to master one of the most technically challenging art forms being practiced today. Kareem Waris Olam Ile Khan is Nigeria's youngest hyperrealism artist. He recently came under the spotlight after drawing a portrait of French President Emmanuel Macron in just two hours. But as Zainab Gokche tells us, his skills don't just end there. Karim Waris Olamilikam is working on a portrait of his mother using a photo taken during her youthful days for reference. This is only one of the 11-year-old artist's many hyperrealism works, consisting primarily of portraits of family and friends. I've been drawing since seven years old, high school, uh, with my friends. I can remember I draw Spar Striker comics. Uh, inside um, 20 Leaves um, book. So I started drawing professionally at the age of eight, nine years old. Hyperrealism is a form of art that produces hand-drawn images meant to appear like high-resolution photographs. Like many urban cities, the genre has gained popularity in various art spaces in Nigeria and Karim was lucky enough to observe artists at work in his hometown Lagos. I was shy to stay in that mist. I stood at the corner and participated with them. So my boss sister saw me that day and she was very surprised and showed my boss that look what this small boy draw. Then my boss said is impressed with my drawings that instead of playing around, I started learning. So he taught me how to shade paint. They call him the youngest hyperrealism artist. He, he knows how to do realism, hyperrealism. But, and also, he also do expressionism at times, like express himself from something that has to do from his mind, like not following the reference totally. He also do, do that. So I won't say, like this is, is this is place is good art. It's a versatile artist. Recently, Karim surprised Emmanuel Macron with a portrait during the French president's official visit to the West African country. He soon became an online sensation, and people are now reaching out to buy his work and commission new projects. So the issue for me is not always about pushing somebody too hard is by helping them and nurturing them to find who they're supposed to be. And I think that someone like him that has this much talent at this age and able to express it so precisely, he has a great opportunity. 
Karim is young, but his dreams are big. He hopes his work will one day be on the walls of galleries, not only in Nigeria, but around the world. Still to come on Showcase, he's back to fight another day. It's great you're helping all these random people. Stay off the radar. Actor Denzel Washington's vengeful vigilante returns to theatres. A different kind of Toy Story. We'll introduce you to a photographer who captures war scenes through the eyes of children. A stitch in time. Meet the women quilting their way to freedom in Peru. We'll bring you those stories later in the show, but first, here's a quick look at a few other ones that caught our eye. The most expensive film ever produced in China has been pulled from cinemas after its opening weekend. Asura, an epic fantasy film with a $100 million budget, made just over $7 million in a few days, making it the biggest failure in Chinese movie history. Producers are planning to rework the film for a second release at a later date. A full-length trailer for the upcoming Queen biopic Bohemian Rhapsody has been released. It focuses on the band's iconic 1985 performance at Live Aid and the recording of some of their biggest hits, including Bohemian Rhapsody and We Will Rock You. The film is set for release in October. American novelist John Irving has been presented with the Dayton Literary Peace Prize for Lifetime Achievement, an annual award to honor writers who promote peace through literature. The 76-year-old author, who has published 14 novels in his 50-year career, often focuses on the impact of social problems in his books. Irving and the winners of the fiction and non-fiction competitions will be honored in October. He's played everyone from Malcolm X to a crooked cop. But whether he's playing good guys or bad ones, Denzel Washington is guaranteed box office gold. His latest outing sees him playing a mercenary who rents out his skills to those in need. Equalizer 2 is a follow-up to the 2014 original, with some fans saying it was worth the wait. They build jails, doesn't it? Character actor Denzel Washington revamped his star image in the early 2000s as an action star. His Oscar-winning role in the high-octane cop drama Training Day marked his first collaboration with director Antoine Fuqua. Just let the animals wipe themselves out. God will. But when somebody does something unspeakable to someone you hardly knew, you do something about it. The successful duo were then paired for the gritty thriller Equalizer. The motion picture featuring the veteran performer as a loner bent on revenge became the biggest R-rated movie debut at the time. 19 seconds. First time to Turkey? No, no, no. Long time ago, different life. Now, four years later, Washington's former secret agent character returns once again. In the sequel, retired Black Ops operative Robert McCall goes after the perpetrators who murdered a longtime friend. And according to the director, their feature looks at the complexities of personal vendetta. Robert McCall, prevention is the key. He understands that. He's, he, most people he gives a chance to do the right thing. That's part of his mantra, right? But these guys hurt a friend and did something horrible to her, you know, to Susan. Uh, it makes it very personal. And for a guy like him, that thing is always in him, and he suppresses that thing, that, that, the violence. But that's what he knows. That's what he's been taught. That's what he's learned. It's hard to keep that monster down. But when you do something that personal to a person like this, it's going to eventually find its way out. And some people need to be dealt with that way. And that's what happens in this case. I thought you were retired. Oh, I am. Just like you're dead. <laughs> in contrast to the actions of his character in the movie, in real life, actor Denzel Washington believes retribution to be a vicious circle. We're tying up loose ends. Exactly. Partner for seven years, Mac. It's a mistake to go to war with him. Success, Success is the best revenge. Mm -hmm. 
Ooh. You know, I, I don't want revenge on, you know, if it's somebody that I don't need in my life, then I need to leave them alone. If we got into the place where I, I need revenge, then I hung around too long, hmm. you know? And with the agency, family. The eagerly awaited revenge movie okay. is expected to be one of the big money makers this summer. And critics say a follow-up could very well be on its way. While there are some children in the world who play pretend war with their friends, there are also those for whom a real war is a part of their daily lives. Instead of plastic tanks and guns, they're confronted by real ones. But one photographer is trying to tell their stories, and he's using their toys to do it. Bright coloured toys set in an old city. It's like a horror toy story of war, but without the blood and mangled bodies. This is the setup for a photo shoot by American artist Brian McCarty. His project, War Toys, opens a window to the rarely told war experiences of children from their perspective through pictures. War Toys is a photo series about children's experiences of war. Um, through an art therapy based approach, children essentially become art directors for my photos of locally found toys. Um, it's a way to articulate the children's first-hand experiences through a filter of play, through a very natural deconstruction. In a child's world who suffer war trauma, a bird from a video game may represent bombs falling from the sky and an elephant may symbolize a lost sibling. McCarty uses art therapy drawings and interviews with the children to depict their accounts using toys. I went into this project, the reinvention of it in 2011, you know, with, from a very academic, artistic point of view, I consulted experts um, in art therapy, expressive therapies. I had the methodology I knew what I was doing and went into it from that perspective. And all of that went out the window when I saw a little girl coloring in pools of blood for the first time. You instantly become an activist artist. McCarty's most recent work was set in Mosul, where thousands of civilians were caught up in the fight. And a little girl from the refugee camp is only one of the children who witnessed the war back then. It's about the bridge. It was destroyed. We crossed it while it was broken. I was dizzy and I was scared. Drawing and visualizing horror and loss isn't easy, but art-based therapy may just be what it takes to address the trauma suffered by children and start their healing process. How do you rebuild after tragedy? A group of women in Peru displaced during the country's long-running internal conflict has found a unique way to remember the family members they lost, one stitch at a time. Every day, these Andean women sew their stories into quilts, known as apieras. People, animals, and landscapes are carefully transcribed onto cloth. For the 60 members of the Mama Kia Association, creating these embroidered quilts is a way of bringing their stories to life. On these pieces of fabric and different textures of wool, threads, we show our joys and sadnesses, and we remember the towns where we lived, how we lived, and what we left behind. These women were all displaced by Peru's internal armed conflict that ravaged the country between 1980 and 2000. They lost parents, husbands, and for some of them, even their children. We gave each other support in one way or another, and in that way we've come to know each other as a family. They're embroidering onto thick jute fabric, which is usually used for sacks and packaging. It's Chilean folklorist Violeta Pada who made the Apiera famous with her solo exhibition at the Louvre Museum in 1964. The women are now displaying their work at various museums in Peru and have been invited to sell their artworks at the Rurak Maki Hechoamano Fair organized in mid-July by the Ministry of Culture. Remember that the majority of those killed in that period were men, and it was the women who were left to lead the families or the communities, and later to lead the popular associations. 
So there's quite an important female role within that period. The women of Mama Kia are using creativity to stitch their lives back together and to keep the memories of those they lost alive. That's it on Showcase for now. Head to our YouTube channel for more from the world of arts and culture. I'm Miranda Ratti. Thanks for joining us. Bye for now.